Hello and welcome to Goat Chats. We're so excited you're here. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Brittany Sweeney. I'm the Communications Manager with the Livestock Conservancy and I have some awesome special guests here with me today to talk about Spanish goats. We have Sandra Kircher and we have Dr. Phil Spondenberg. Thanks for joining me today, you guys. Do you all want to introduce yourselves a little bit before we get started with our super fun goat tober? Sure. I'll just quickly say I'm Sandra Kirscher, Program Manager with the Livestock Conservancy, and I manage the Shave and to Save Them Initiative, as well as the Cultivating Leadership Breed Association Accreditation Program. And I'm, <laughs> I'm Phil Spondenberg, and I'm a professor at a veterinary college, but I've actually been working with the Livestock Conservancy for ever since it started. <laughs> it used to run up my kitchen table. And I've been working on breed conservation for even longer than that, specifically with Spanish goats for over 30 years now. So maybe a little bit of a long-term perspective that might be useful to people. That's right, we've got the foremost expert here. So um, if you've got goat questions, Spanish goat questions, put them in the Facebook chat. We will love to get to them fairly soon. Uh, before we get started, I'm gonna go ahead and say thank you to Manipro. They are sponsoring goat chats today. And then we've got a quick one minute video from them. So just stick with us and we'll be right back. Mm -hmm. Champions, colleagues, roommates, and personal trainers. <laughs> Whatever role they play, they're an important part of our lives. In their quiet way. And their not so quiet way. <laughs> they keep us young. On our feet. On the go. They pull us back to nature. And push us toward the next adventure. <laughs> and as much as we count on them, they count on us all the more to nurture their lives with the same commitment to protecting them, helping them grow and thrive, treating them as well as they treat us <laughs> by giving them a little more of our lives. Because no matter what role they play out here or in here, we're here to make their lives the best they can be. Manapro, Man nurturing life. All right, thank you, Man and Pro, and welcome back. Sindra, do you want to jump in? Certainly. Thanks, Brittany, and thanks to your helper you have there, too, I see on the screen. <laughs> Phil, thank you so much for joining us today. We're super excited that you could join us to talk about a very important breed to us and probably many of our viewers, and that is the Spanish goat breed. Um, before we dig too much into the history of the Spanish goat, let's... Um, Let's clear up a little maybe misunderstanding, Phil. Can you talk about the difference between the Spanish goat breed and the Spanish goat? <laughs> when people say Spanish goat, they actually mean two different things. And those two different things are really, really, really different. One of those is goats that actually do have a Spanish origin. And um, that's what we're interested in as conservationists. But what happens in the old time vernacular, and this is really true, you know, in a large part of the United States, is that Spanish goat just meant any goat from anywhere that just wasn't a registered goat. And so, you know, if it was a registered goat, it was an Angora or a Nubian or an Alpine. And if it wasn't a registered goat, it was just still some Spanish goat. Well, those those two things are really, really different because there is an, a, a, an important breed here that does go back to this Spanish origin. And what we we always tend to think of the Spaniards as being in the Southwest and in Texas, but they were also in the Southeast all the way up to North Carolina up until ooh, probably the 1600s at some point, um, and even into the 1700s. Um, and so, yep, we still find them there too. So these, um, if we talk about you know, defining the breed, it's the goats that go back to the Spanish origin. We still have them and they're, they're, they're real important to conserve. Awesome. Thank you for clarifying that. So talking about time frames, um, let's get into a quick history and, and uh, then we'll move into kind of best uses um, qualities of the Spanish goat breed that we're talking about today. Let's talk a little bit about the history. When when did they first? Well, 
<laughs> or be recognized, let's put it that way. Well, they, they, they first got here, um, here meaning the Americas, <laughs> probably in the early 1500s. And um, what was brought here is probably goats, mostly from the Canary Islands, you know, but also from mainland Spain. And the, the, the really odd thing of history is that um, we, for years, for centuries, we got around from point A to point B on a horse. You know, and so basically, when you look at horses, since people were going from point A to point B on a horse, horses are actually fairly you know, variable. You know, I mean, uniformly influenced across great um, periods of history and as well as geography. Strangely, but truly, uh, yeah, we rode our horse, but we took our goat with us. I have no idea why we did that. But um, when you talk about the genetic differentiation and uh, geographical stratification of goat breeds, it actually turns out to be a little bit different than cows. And that must be because cows and pigs were difficult to take. Goats were easy. And the, the general pattern was that the explorers would take goats, maybe a source of milk on long voyages, you know, milk for your coffee. Um, and then as they approached different land masses, they would actually turn goats loose or start colonies and those would actually have goats because since goats are a relatively small package that's adaptable, they're really good, especially in the initial stages of colonization because they serve as a really convenient meat source, especially when you don't have refrigeration and their reproductive rate is such that you have plenty of extras to do with whatever you need. So that's kind of the history. But um, if you go back to that Spanish origin, then today we have to look at, okay, what's left? And that that separates out into four things that we know of and one that we think is there. And those four things are um, Pacific Islands. So San Clemente Island, Santa Catalina Island, and then it, as you go up, um, Jeddah Island, Hawaii Islands, and also probably Arapawa, because um, of the way the genetics comes out. You could argue that those probably actually fit in here too. Those are a little bit different than most of the mainland ones, which sort out into Texas. And Texas, we can actually separate into two groups, the big hill country group. There's also some goats from the Rio Grande Valley. Um, and they're a little bit different enough that yeah, if we want to split, we can split. Um, and then in the southeast, we have a, a number of strains, uh, low country, Bayless, uh, and some of the Norman, <clears throat> Jericho, a bunch of other ones that are these old, long, long isolated herds um, that, that still go back to that origin and still have that look and still have that adaptation and that production potential. So those, those are the main threads. To those, we could actually add anything that's still out there in the southwest that we just haven't bumped into yet. But those are the main threads. Okay. Um, so, go ahead. I was going to, well, I might be taking you in a direction you weren't quite ready to go yet, but I was going to say, so I'm, what I'm hearing is West Coast, Southwest, and Southeast, as far as um, the main population of these goats. What is their adaptability like to more northerly climates? Would you recommend uh, them? Well, <laughs> yeah, you recommend them all over the place. Uh, <laughs> They, they actually have proven out to be very, very, um, very adapted and very adaptable. And so um, there's there's large herds in Montana. Um, and you actually mentioned that you're the shave them to save them guru. And um, a lot of these actually produce a harvestable amounts of cashmere. And some years actually use, use them for that. And I've actually combed my fair share of goats and spun the cashmere and it's exquisite. So... Um, and you know that that's one of the hallmarks of what they do. And actually, in Argentina, they have two breeds of old Spanish goats that are heavy cashmere producers. So it, it's it, it's there, and people can either select for it or not. Um, the other aspects of adaptation, um, especially in the southeast, are adaptation to internal parasites. Um, you do see that in a lot of the Texas lines as well. Um, some of them not as strongly as in the southeast, because in the southeast, that humid environment is really really challenging for that. This turns out to be um, one of the more one of the main pulls. And uh, Richard Browning, there at Tennessee State University, has done some really exquisite research. And he's uh, anytime you have a chance to listen to him, do it because he's one of those people I could just listen to for eternity and never get tired of it. Um, really engaging, and he's really really smart, and he really knows his stuff. Um, but um, he he's actually shown in multi breed comparisons the 
incredible adaptation of these goats for for strong hooves and also for parasite resistance. And depending on your environment, those can be extremely important. Um, the hoof to hoof condition is actually quite interesting because you can solve that, you know, either medically or you can solve it genetically. And he's shown that these goats, in fact, solve it genetically, and then you don't have to worry about the medicals. <laughs> so, so that works um, as a low, you know, sustainable, low input resource is still quite productive. And so over the years, um, we, we can get into the weeds and get into the details, but it turned out that the Spanish goat, um, our North American Spanish goat local, you know, came out, you know, pretty well tops or tied for the tops in overall productivity and overall in kid production. So, you know, that, that, that means something commercially. Now that, that gets to be a really, really interesting finding because um, animals, if you think about it, you, you have adaptation and you have production. And as organisms, goats, us, everything else, you've got two little pockets to put stuff. <laughs> you can put it into adaptation or you can put it into production. And most of North America and most North Americans live in actually pretty benign environments. So if you live in a temperate area, you have a pretty benign environment. The grass grows, you know, the, the rain comes, everything's, everything's great. Well, in that case, you really don't need adaptation. You can just go for production. And our, our North American mindset is very much in that direction. And so we forget that animals are making, they're making a bargain every time they do this. If you live in a challenging environment, you have to put most of your resources into adaptation. Now, the whole story gets really, really interesting. And one of the geniuses that actually saved the Spanish goat breed was Robert Kinsey. And he started out oh, probably over 30 years ago in Texas, maybe 40 years ago by now. I don't know, I'm getting old. I have to go back and revise my timelines. But um, he, he started off with local goats there in the hill country of Texas. And but, you know, the, the, the does were probably 60 pounds or so. You know, and then over the years, um, he, he selected them and he got them to be heavier and heavier. And, and this was a fairly large herd, so he could do that quite well. And over decades, he got them up to 150 pounds. And then he realized, oh, they're no longer adapted. You know, they, they, they weren't lasting for these long productive lives that his original goats were. So he pulled it back to about 125 pounds and he found a sweet spot where he could have the adaptation in that environment and he could also have the production. And this, this is a really, really important lesson. They have, there's a number of spin-offs from this. Number one is if he had not saved those 60-pound goats, we would not have the Kensing line of Spanish goats today. Mm. Okay, so now when the newcomers come in and when they find these old long-term family herds, especially in the Southeast, they go, well, but they're not big enough. It's like, well, big enough for what? I mean, you know, they're big enough to have kids all the time and they're big enough to survive, you know, and they're also the raw material from which the today's breeders can then start their own selection um, projects to actually increase the productivity without losing the adaptation. So mm -hmm. that, that's, that's one important lesson. And the other important lesson is it, it takes people doing that. And so it took Robert Kinsing doing that you know, going out there, finding the goats, committing to that long-term goal of forming them into something that's really, really quite valuable. The raw materials are still out there. And we also have the advantage of a lot of these lines now that have been selected over many, many decades for the productivity, ending up with that nice, sweet combination. So again, it depends on the project you're interested in, but they all need to be done. If we all go in the direction of production, 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 you're going to lose all those old lines that are not quite up there to the production, but still have the adaptability. Mm -hmm. Another interesting case is the Jericho goats from Alabama. You know, they were just old local goats. And then um, Mrs. Rudder decided that, hey, I wanna select these. And so she started selecting them for productivity and ended up with a really, really nice strain of Southeast, you know, adapted goats. But other, other lines are out there and we don't need to lose them. We need to save them. And Donna Askew is working with the low country goats and doing the same thing and you know, making good progress with you know a very, very small start in terms of goat numbers, but a very, very important project. So there's, there's all sorts of people doing really interesting things. Um, now, the further north you go, the easier it gets because you're not going to have the worm problems that we do in the southeast. And you know the sky's the limit. We can see where it goes. But 
that adaptation is the important thing. Um, some of this gets down to what are you going to measure? And so everybody goes, well, you know, I mean, and I'm not, I'm not a huge fan of show rings and most people already know that, you know, but if we line all those goats up, you know, I'm going to pick out the biggest goat. You can't help but do that. You know, you're going to pick out the biggest goat, but especially on these, these are a maternal breed and the maternal aspects are really, really important. What you want to do is you want to, you want to pick out that doe that's like 12, 13, 14 years old, always had twins, always raised them and never got dewormed and never was lame. And she's out there, you know, she's out there. Well, that goat is shown enough, big enough, <laughs> and she's growing fast enough. She's doing everything she needs to do. We, and we don't need to forget that. It's really, really, really difficult to identify that, especially as a one-off in a show ring. You, you can't. Now, I, I do raise goats. I raise myotonic goats, true confession here. But that was back when they were really, really rare. And the, the students come up and they ultrasound the goats. You know, and every now and again, you just, they'll pull out the right two goats and you can say, okay, which one of these goats is better? And there'll be this one big, smooth, wonderful goat that's absolutely worthless. I mean, she doesn't, <laughs> is, she can't raise them. You know, she's always got worms, something, you know. And then there's this ratty little thing next to her that's having twins and triplets and raising them all the time. And her kids are ending up bigger than the other one, you know, and it's a real take home lesson. You know, I mean, you yeah, Sponnenberg, why do you have that big, smooth coat that's not productive? Well, she probably was a cool color or something, but, um, you know, but that, that can't fool me. You know, you need to pay attention to which goats are actually doing the job that you want done, and then they look right. You know, I mean, a, a, a 13, 14 year old goat is going to have the right confirmation to pull that trick off. And if you've kept her, she's going to have the right temperament so you didn't get really, really aggravated at her. And you keep track of the kidding percentages and things like that. And then, yeah, it's all going to be there. Mm -hmm. Phil, you just mentioned confirmation. We haven't really given a description, a physical description, other than possibly weight. Um, could you talk a little bit about, because I know there's some variety in, in what you find out there as far as appearance. Well, there's always going to be some variety. And when we... Uh, talk about conserving these goats there is um there is a certain look that goes with this and usually what they um the, the classic the classic now there's going to be some variation okay so don't you know if you're listening to this don't get really really mad at me i mean get mad at me for, for something else um but the, the real classic appearance is going to be a goat um that and most of these characteristics are going to be on the head, which is kind of interesting. But the head is actually going to tell you a lot about breed character, and the breed character is going to tell you about the productivity. The horns are usually um, pretty long. And in the case of the males, um, ideally what they do is they actually come out of the head, and they're going to curve up and out, and they're going to have a nice twist to them. And usually that that um, the edge, the keel, which is the edge of the horn that's kind of towards the front and the middle, is actually going to have, be fairly sharp and not real rounded. But um, that the, basically what this is telling you is um, this goat, most of the goats in the Mediterranean basin all look like this. And, you know, basically if you put Nubian or Boer or, or Savannah in them, those horns get shorter, they get rounder, and they get um, less curly. If you put a uh, dairy goat into them, they're still going to have a lot of horn but they're not going to have that nice twist. You're going to lose the twist and the ears are going to be different. Now the ears on a you know classic Spanish goat are going to um, be horizontal, but not, they're not going to be straight out of the head. They're going to actually be carried up alongside the head. So usually horizontal and moderately large. They're not going to be huge lop-eared, but they're going to be moderately large. They're going to be bigger than an Alpine type goat. Um, they're going to be smaller than a Nubian type goat or a boar and usually carried up toward the front, alongside the head, horizontal. And then the head, this head shape, usually from the profile, it's a straight profile. It may have a little bump in the nose, usually not a really profound uh, Roman nose like you'd find in a boar or a Nubian, um, or a dish face like you'd find in some other breeds. And that all, when all those go together, um, it really forms a really, really nice package. Um, some of them are actually going to have horns that come out of the head a little bit taller and straighter, but usually with the same kind of twist or curve in them, but usually that sharp anterior keel. Um, one of the dangers I'm seeing now is that um, some 
some Kiko goats actually have close to this appearance. And that's because of their long-term, very, very diverse background in dairy goats, Nubians, others, and also in feral goats uh, from New Zealand, some of which actually have this same originally Spanish sort of background, interestingly. So that would be one. But um, yeah, the looks are important, um, not to the extent of everything else, but they're, they're telling you something. And so some of those goats, especially from the Rio Grande Valley, you know, they have these they have these horns and they come out of their head. Here's my head on a goat. And they, they come out and they twist and they go all the way out. And um, actually some of the low country goats, not the ones that we actually took off the island, but on an adjacent island, have that same look. And it's it's really, really classic. And it's really very, very characteristic and really difficult to duplicate any other way. Mm -hmm. You know, when you look at the fine points, I mean, you know, yeah, they should look like any good goat, you know. I mean, you want them to be up on their pasterns, have strong pasterns. And that sounds weird, but you, when you have strong pasterns, it actually carries through the entire goat. And so then the top line is going to be strong, the legs are going to be strong, and they're going to last forever. Uh, the angles of the limbs can be also important. Um, there's something called post-legged, which means they don't have much angle from the side and the back. Those goats just don't last as long. So usually the, the ones with the weak pasterns just break down and the, the legs go bad and the feet go bad. You get tired of dealing with it. Um, the other ones, usually they get arthritic and they just don't last as long. Mm -hmm. And what about their coat? That can vary quite a bit too. Colors uh, use coat, right? Yeah, the colors vary all over the place. Now, a whole lot of people really, really like them black. And um, I'll, I'll put in a positive word for a black goat. Um, but I'm not, I'm not discounting everything else. But when you have these range goats and you end up like, so some of the Saifan and Koi, they, in Texas, they had huge herds. They were all black. Um, when you do that, there's really nothing else that can give you that. Um, which is not to say that the other colors are not Spanish, but it is to say that when you've got a huge herd of all, all black goats, it's really difficult to pull that trick off, you know, historically. I mean, I could do it now with crossbreeding, you know, but if you have a history of a long-term isolated herd, and they're all black, then that's what they are. I mean, end of discussion. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, now th there's other there's other sorts of really, really interesting things though that um, some of the Kinsey goats have a um, kind of a black belly pattern over a kind of a cream uh, base coat color. And that specific pattern occurs in um, some Spanish breeds and in some um, Brazilian Portuguese breeds that come from Portugal and Spain. So mm -hmm. you actually do see that. Um, so there's another one. Now, the average casual observer, I mean, I'm, I'm a color geek. So, you know, yeah, I'm looking for weird colors. You know, you're going to find that. And then there's another one, which is, um, again, uh, seems to actually be fairly limited in geographic distribution to North America, Brazil, Spain. And it's called, in Portuguese, it's repartida. Um, and the front half of the goat is black and the back half of the goat is either tan or cream or red uh, but the details are agonizing i know but i mean the, the front of the legs are tan or cream the backs of the legs are um black which is kind of the reverse of something like a Santa goat which is another one of these patterns that actually probably does in fact come from spain um, it's a little bit different from the repartita but it has the black front and the tan rear so there, there are things in there and then some of them are actually kind of this blue gray wonderful blue gray color and that actually there's entire group uh, breeds of goats in Portugal today. Now, what you have to realize is that once we define these and once we select them, we can make them any color we want. And then we're going to sit down in about 50 years and we're going to say, oh, but they should all be this color. Yeah, but then we're, just, we're, eliminating, we're eliminating everything else, even though that, that's actually in there and mm -hmm. still legitimate as part of the breed. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned cashmere a little bit earlier. So is the cashmere following specific lines? of Spanish goats, or is it following um, geographical lines? Where where are we finding, if somebody were interested in pursuing cashmere without going out and buying what is termed a cashmere goat? Um, a really, really good question. And, and another, okay, so hair varies. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna put in a good word to some of them, some of these goats are shaggy. especially <laughs> down the middle of the back and down the lower legs, um, and actually, <laughs> There's a special Spanish word for that, which is arraspil, which is kind of fun. But um, yes, that's part and partial of the breed. 
Now, some of the ones with shorter hair, and especially these longer haired ones, will actually produce quite a bit of cashmere. And some breeders select for it. Now, if you had a huge herd, you're going to have some goats with cashmere and some goats without cashmere, and you can actually select for it, you know, fairly effectively and fairly quickly. Mm -hmm. um, so cashmere is the fine downy undercoat of any goat. So um, yes, there is a cashmere goat, and yes, they are selected to have heavy cashmere production. Um, you can do that with purebred Spanish goats. You can do that with crossbred goats from a variety of backgrounds. And that's what they've done in Australia. That's what they've done in uh, the United Kingdom now. So you can do that, um, but you can also have purebred Spanish goats with, with heavy cashmere production. Now, when you, um, and I'm not, I'm not really, really up to date on the cashmere market or the cashmere industry in North America today, but um, it, it still does rely a lot on kid production for meat production. Um, because when you do raise cashmere, you are competing directly on a global market with all those wonderful people in Mongolia and Inner Mongolia and um, in Kashmir and Pakistan and Afghanistan. And <clears throat> so it's an, it's an international commodity and you have to figure out how you fit into that. And I, um, I actually do comb my own goats, you know, and in my own herd, you probably have out of a herd of 50 or 60 now, there's probably 10 that are worth actually combing. And then I ran out of steam, so I usually comb two or three. <laughs> but I have some, and if you're a spinner, cashmere is, it's challenging and completely worthwhile. But um, a pound of cashmere to spin would take you a while. <laughs> so a little bit goes a long way. Does the cashmere have crimp like the, like the wool on our um, yeah. Okay. Now you're changing topics. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I, and I'm doing this from memory and I'm old, so I may not remember everything, but you know, basically what you're doing is you're, you're evaluating four different characteristics. One of those is length. Mm -hmm. um, one of those is diameter. Mm -hmm. And then there's two more. <laughs> and one of those is Micron. style. One, one, yes. one of the microns is the diameter. Yeah, so the, diameter. Uh, the style, which is, um, it's not so much crimp, but it's actually does that fiber go in all sorts of different directions instead of only in one plane. So it actually may be crimp and it also may be style. I made those two up. Um, I didn't make style up. Um, <laughs> but the, the length and the diameter are both important. Mm -hmm. And what you want is you want, I believe you want something under 16 microns, which is pretty fine. Mm -hmm. and, um, of course, the problem with any sort of crossbreeding with Angora goats is you're going to actually increase that diameter quite a bit. So mm -hmm. you can stay, what you want is you want a product that is very, very fine and very, very different than any guard hairs, because then when you dehair it, you can actually dehair it pretty efficiently and pretty effectively, and you don't end up with any intermediate fibers. I don't want to go too far down a fiber rabbit hole here, but I do have one question. This popped into my head at the wool market, um, the wool event last weekend. A, a um, producer told me that fiber quality, meaning diameter, was what she was referring to, micron count, varies with the protein content of their diet. Do you, do you know? Um, probably some, but it's also under very, very strong genetic control. Okay. You, you can starve an animal into a fine fiber. Mm -hmm. Now, um, and when we say fine, um, I don't even like the word coarse anymore. You say like a strong wool or a fine wool. And it's important. I mean, that catch me up. We're not talking wool, I realize, but we'll have a little bit of a diversion here. Every wool type has a perfect use. And for that use, it is the perfect wool type. And goats, if you need, if you have a use for mohair, nothing else is going to satisfy that. If you have a use for cashmere, Nothing else is going to satisfy that, unless it's the fine undercoat of a yak. Good luck with that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Bill. All right, so our plan today was to talk about Spanish goats past, present, and future. I think we've talked a little bit, quite a bit about their past and their present. Um, more, more to the point, actually, on their present is we do have three Spanish goat breed associations here in the U.S., yeah, right. we do. And I try to work with all three uh, constructively. They're all three a little bit different. They're doing a little bit different things. 
Um, and th this is a good thing. Now, um, the this is a land race breed, and so the discovery phase is far from over. So, in, so the present situation is we still need to secure as broad a representation as we can. And of course, the danger is once things come into our notice, then we're likely to think that nothing else needs to come in. And I, it's either a year or two ago, for example, we found the Didway herd in the hill country of Texas. No problem. The Didway herd actually has a longer history of isolation than many of the other established foundation bloodlines of the Spanish goat breed. And we're still we're still coming up with stuff like that. We're still coming up with stuff that, you know, we should have found years and years and years ago. That it, I'm not saying it's more important than what we have out there today. That's already documented, but it's equally important, and it's no different. And so we need to make sure of that. So going forward in the present situation, there there's some strengths because now we have we have a breed association. We have breed associations, plural. And we have a better definition. We need to focus on that definition, though. That needs to be a little bit more deliberate than it's been, perhaps. But also, um, going forward, so we're going to talk about the present and the, and the future here. We need to figure out what's going to be important for this breed. And the present situation is that the, the prices have skyrocketed. And that helps the breeders. And we're not against helping the breeders. But we need to figure out what is being valued in that skyrocketing price. And if it's size, 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 that's gonna take us in a different direction. If it's cashmere, 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 that's gonna take us in a different direction. If it's color, 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 that's gonna take us in a different direction. If it's horns and ears, that's gonna take us in a different direction. So we need to kind of pick our goals carefully. And that, that sounds stupid, but um, there's been enough uh, movement in other breeds. I raised my atonic goats for a long time, blue eyes. Everybody wanted blue eyed goats. You know, I was like, well, I mean, I, most of you aren't eating the eyes. Uh, so, um, you know, you, you need to pick your goal carefully. You know, and, and I love a blue-eyed goat. Don't get me wrong. I got blue eyes myself, see? But um, you, need to, you need to pick your goals carefully. Now, the, the danger is that one of the reasons for this really real surge in popularity is the adaptation. And the adaptation, we can actually lose it if we're not careful. Now, other present situations, this is a really, really interesting breed um, because if if we just went numerically, um, it is approaching graduating off of our list. But what's really, really interesting is that there are huge herds of these goats. And that sounds really, really good and really, really secure. But if you have three or four herds of 1,500 head a piece, all of a sudden you got a, a population of 6,000. But if one of those people dies in a car crash and their kids aren't, you know, their children, sorry, their children aren't interested in raising goats, then you can lose 1,500 goats just like that. And so it's a really, really interesting breed population because you do have these herds of huge numbers of goats. Those are really, really important to the breed because that's a, that's a selection environment that you really can't duplicate anywhere else. But that old isolated herd of 30 goats in Mississippi, that's a long-term family herd, that is equally important because they're doing something different. They're doing something extremely important. And they're also selecting for adaptation and their own production goals. So you get this really interesting um, breed structure that really needs to be managed very, very carefully because you have the huge populations, you have the small herds that are doing important things. Neither one's more important than the other. They both have different needs from a breed association. They have different needs for technical support. Another current development is um, DNA testing. And this is getting to be really, really interesting because most of the DNA testing is all based on micro satellites. And we're going to get into the weeds here incredibly fast because the microsatellites are these um, little things of uh, duplicated, uh, they call them tandem repeats. So it's going to be a real short um, repeat of certain DNA. So far, so good. These things are absolutely wonderful for studying breed relationships. They're absolutely wonderful for parentage um, identification. And they are not related to the function of the goat at all. Um, they, they, they don't code for proteins. They don't code for anything. 
And um, in the past, they called them just junk DNA. And that, that's a little harsh, and it's not completely accurate. OK, so don't, so don't take that lesson home. But th the key thing is, oh, yes, they're really quite useful in teasing out some of these details. But if you're trying to predict future production for a goat, there's some real questions there, and they don't do that. I mean, if they do it, it's only by accident because they're identifying a goat as Spanish. Um, and they, they can't even do that all that well, but we're working towards that. Now, um, so far, so good. So if what use is it? Well, it's of great use because it actually shows you how things are related, shows you, you know, where rare things are that you can actually come out and save. But it's not going to tell you which goat's going to grow better, which goat's going to be from this group, from that group. Um, very unlikely to tell you that. Um, so that is in the other problem with the DNA um, is if if we start measuring things besides microsatellites, you're actually going to find probes for, oh, this this DNA sequence made this goat excellent in this way. And that sounds really, really harmless. But then once we start selecting for that, then we're not just watching the goat. We're only selecting for the DNA. And we're going to be um, we're going to be kicking stuff out left and right. And mm -hmm. some of the other goats have answered that same problem in a different way. And if we're not looking, then we're going to discard those before we know the answer. And so that's that's a real problem with the DN the more thorough DNA testing for production characteristics is once we find an answer, we're going to think it's the answer, and then we're going to eliminate all the other answers. And a really good um, example actually comes from sheep with a prolificacy. Uh, sheep answers the issue of how many kids, how many lambs to have different ways, very, very different genetic mechanisms. If we start selecting for only one of those, we're going to eliminate the others. And the others actually do have very, very useful applications in different situations. So we need to be really, really careful with what we do there. And you're also talking about eliminating, looking at temperament and mothering instincts and things like that as well when you're looking just specifically at dna correct um and yeah d behavior dna all that mm -hmm. and any, any any anybody with a large herd of goats will tell you that some of them are horrendous i mean like, goats are going to hell for a reason <laughs> I mean, they, you know they they do have a pecking order and they will beat each other up mm -hmm. and I, in my own herd you know we have had um senior you know, they call them queens, but we've had queens that were just, we had one that was just uh, violent. I mean, just uh, gratuitously violent all the time. I actually had to tip her horns to keep everybody from you know, getting beat up. And even her daughters wouldn't have anything to do with her. And it's like, well, I'm not living like that. That's no way to be, you know, and then, and then we have others that actually rise to the top and it's all very, very subtle and you don't notice any, any violence. And, and those goats are really worth a lot of money. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You know, it's really, really difficult unless you live with the goats, you can't figure it out. But some of these goats run a tight ship without violence. And I love it when I have one of those in top lead. You know, and then of course she'll age out and then somebody else will come in and it's, you know, the next little mm -hmm. or Stalin or whatever they are, you know, and yeah. you just navigate your way around it. So your, your tough queen leads me to a topic. I think a lot of people, um, don't want to talk about, don't want to think about, especially folks with smaller flocks and herds that maybe think of their animals a lot like pets as well as, as production, um, and that's culling. Can you talk a little bit about the importance of culling in, as, a, as a strategic component of long-term maintenance of these breeds? Well, um, yeah, okay, so... <laughs> This, this coin has two sides. One is selection and the other is culling. Okay, so when we talk about selection, it's like, oh yeah, this is great. You know, which, um, what do we want? You know, what do we want? And so that's the positive side. But then the question is, what do we do with what we don't want? <laughs> and um, we can either let nature take care of it, you know, or we can take care of it. And, you know, I do sell goats for meat um, and the meat market is strong most of the time. Um, it seems to be less strong when I take them to the market than the week before, but that's another issue. Um, and so, you know, basically culling, you know, you, you have to just, you have to decide which direction you're going to go. And then you have to decide what stays in and what leaves. 
And so um, increasingly, parasite resistance is really, really important. This year, we had a wet year and a weird year, and we had real warm problems. So yes, that's a problem, but it's also a solution because I do have a couple of does never have been dewormed in two years. That's telling me something. Mm -hmm. So, you know, yep, the son of one of those is going to be used this fall because, you know, she she twins, she doesn't need to be dewormed, and she's wonderful. You know, she's, she's a little bit smaller than everybody else. Not everybody else. I mean, she's on, she's on the smaller end of the elite ones. And, but yeah, I can use that and I can use that parasite resistance. So um, for me, especially for Spanish goats, I would emphasize um, mothering ability, longevity, especially on the doe end. Um, more important than on the buck end for a host of reasons. We don't have to get into that. But um, longevity, fertility, and adaptation. So feet, feet worm resistance, things like that. Mm -hmm. That's And then, you know, if all that's met, then growth rate. But, you know, basically, it takes a really, really good single kid to make up for two pretty moderate kids. And so the twinning and the ability to raise them or triplets and ability to raise them, those are going to basically um, – Trump anything else. You're going to outweigh anything else that you can come up with. So when you're talking about breeding, selecting for breeding, you are not looking just at size or just at coat color. You are looking at a much larger picture. Oh, yeah. I mean, they, they have, yeah, right, you're looking at a larger picture. And it's the, uh, it's the history of the dam. I, I actually... Yeah, you get somebody else in to talk about the other side. But you know, most of my most of my selection program is in fact on the maternal side. I am picking a buck to save from what its mother did. Mm -hmm. You know, and then well, case in point, you know, I've got this really, really beautiful little speckled brown buck. Um, and he, I mean, he is absolutely phenomenally beautiful. He is tiny. He was a twin. His mother always had twins, always walked off from one of them, never milked well. You know, and so it's like, no, we're not <laughs> sure he's beautiful, but he's going to be beautiful for somebody else. Am I a rat for saving him for somebody else? No. Full disclosure. <laughs> no, it'll be full disclosure and they will want that goat. And mm -hmm. sure, if somebody came and he's got, well, I've got these grandkids that love these goats. They want a smaller goat. They want this sort of goat. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. So what else do we, we're, we're getting kind of close to our, our uh, end of our hour here. Is there any other important tidbits of information that you feel like folks need to know today before we open up for questions? Well, we can open up for questions, but I mean, I, you know, the, the discovery phase is still on. The rescue phase is still on. We need to go out and look, find these goats. I heard of a nice herd in South Georgia just three weeks ago. Awesome. You know, and the, the ladies had them for 90 years <clears throat> and you know, they look right. So it's like, yeah, let's, let's do it. This is great. That's awesome. <laughs> Brittany, do we have any questions? Right now? No, no questions. So if anybody has questions, please type them in. Let us know. We'd like to get to those. What should somebody do if they think they have Spanish goats? Should they call you up, Sandra, and say, hey, I've got Spanish goats? <laughs> yes, and then I'll call Phil. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, and that gets back to the, how do, how do we do this? You know, well, basically we, we hear about goats and then we try to investigate the history. You know, what, what, what was the herd started with? When was the herd started with? Was anything else added? And then we look at photographs and photographs of mature billy goats actually work out to be the most telling. And we can tell on everything else, but on those, mm -hmm. that's important. And then um, it, it either all adds up or it all doesn't add up. And then we go to the next step. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, no questions, no questions, huh? No <laughs> questions. People are just like absorbing it. <laughs> yes. It's been a lot of really awesome, great information today. Mm -hmm. uh, I always feel like I learn something new on these chats every time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, tradition. We didn't. We didn't actually use the phrase, Phil. But um, transition plans are, are an important take-home point to uh, to make sure to put out there. When you were talking about these important, very large but very few flocks or herds of these goats that perhaps have 
families that aren't interested in in pursuing raising these these goats. Yeah, um, and there, there's two sides to that. One is a conscientious breeder is sure to start new herds with their stock. Okay, and then if there is a disaster, well, yeah, there's other herds. So I mean. Who knows? I may find a car crash on my way home. I'm hoping not, but you never know. I mean, the students here drive like maniacs. Um, so, <laughs> well, but even if, or there may be a lightning storm and all my ghosts die. And yeah, I have lost ghosts to lightning before, so it could happen. You know, but over the years, I've sold so many goats. That, you know, basically what I've done is going to continue even if my herd is lost. And that, that's not trivial. And that some people try to keep hold of everything. Don't do that. You need to get it out there. You need to help other people start. You need to, you know, you know, basically repeat what you're doing. And then also in your own situation, you know, do you have a transition? Do you have a place for these goats to go, you know, in the event of a disaster? Um, in the event of a hurricane, I raise goats in Florida, you know? Well, you know, now there's a disaster. Do you have plan B, you know, or is there another place for those goats to go? And, um, that's that's going to be important for everybody because you can't. I mean, obviously, you don't plan for disasters, but transition is extremely important. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, we do have a couple of questions that just came in. Let's see. Hi, Kevin. Thanks for joining us today. We're glad you're here. Kevin says I'd be interested in hearing more about the discovery phase in relation to land race breeds in general. Well, I, I did, um, it works for all breeds, basically, but in land race breeds, um, what you're looking for is overlooked sources of the original resource. Um, and you rely on the history, you know, when, when, were the, when was the population started, what sort of things went into it at the beginning, and that's usually local, you know, but then what could have been in the local area, and then you go through and you actually evaluate the overall type um, and those two are actually fairly cheap to do. You can also investigate the DNA. I'm going to bring that in a little bit reluctantly because some of that depends on the species. That can actually be very useful or it can be no use at all. And you don't know until you start which one it's going to be. Um, in decades and decades and decades of doing this, the DNA has never told us a story different than the history and the and the external type of the animal. Mm -hmm. We came close a couple of times, but when well, we actually went back and traced everything out, no, it all matched up. So um, it's, it's a three-legged stool, the history, the appearance, and that DNA investigation. Great question. Mm -hmm. Hi, Herbert. Thanks for joining us today. We're glad you're here. Herbert says, is there any department funding support for DNA testing, or is that on the farmer? Goat farming old Irish lowry goats on the last closed island here in Ireland. Okay, first of all, you need to get a hold of me and you need to send me some photographs. <laughs> um, my email is really obvious, so go ahead. Because um, these are really interesting, because again, that's an old, um, it's an old isolated population. We need to, we need to save that. Um, I, we don't have any funding for that. Um, we, sometimes for specific target breeds, we end up with um, with funding that will actually help support the DNA. I believe um, we're doing that right now with Gulf Coast sheep, for example. We've done it in the past. Um, we did it with Randall cattle in the last several years. So, um, yes, occasionally there are. A lot of times it's on the farmer. Um, and usually with the microsatellite panels, what you want to do is you want to make sure that it's going somewhere where they can adequately compare it especially to other local breeds in the area so that you can figure out if the, if the story is adding up or not. Um, lots of cautions there, but it's all, it's all doable. Awesome. Great to hear. Get in contact with Phil. <laughs> all right. Hi, Sherry. Thanks for joining us today. Sherry says, I have SCI goats and I'm mainly interested in what this program is doing well that we can adapt to help the SEI population develop without losing the ad adaptive aspects, especially considering how scattered and diverse the SEI GBA population is. Any thoughts? Yeah, um, San Clemente Island goats are important. Um, and <clears throat> actually the discovery phase for Santa Catalina goats is still going on. And we do mean Santa Catalina Island goats. A lot of the goats that are sold as Catalina goats are actually 
not from Santa Catalina Island, but with the San, Clem uh, San Clemente Island goats, um, that program is, um, you know, basically sorting out um, pedigrees, and some has actually been difficult, which is okay, because um, it's the history of the herd. It's the history of the herds, and that's okay. But documenting who has what, you know, if it traces back to the island and how, all those things are important. And basically, just expanding numbers and keeping it going, um, all those are important. And then the culling side for not losing the adaptive aspects. The the small island populations are actually quite interesting, and this is actually going to be true of the Irish population as well, because um, especially in the San Clemente Island and Jedid Island, island the, the long, the very, very small foundation, what went into it, and then the long isolation, you end up with a fairly minimal genetic variation. And that can be an interesting uh, project to maintain. It can be done, but I, I think numbers, 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 when you start talking about those sorts of issues. Mm -hmm. All right, I think that wraps up our questions. Hi, Heather. Thanks for joining us today. Heather says, fascinating. Thank you, Tog Breeder here. So looks like she's raising Tog goats. Tog and Bergs. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah. Phil, thanks so much. Thanks for joining us today and talking about this very important breed to us and to all of those folks that are raising them and folks that are out there looking for them. Good information. Lots of it. Okay. Absolutely. Well, let's wrap it up with our um, shameless plug of the day. So, uh, Phil, I believe you've got a few books. Oh. Just a couple. <laughs> <laughs> so, let's see. I don't have a copy of all of them in front of me, but whoops. Sorry, Brittany. We were doing it at the same time. <laughs> Managing Breeds for a Secure Future. Phil yeah, and actually, if we do want to put a shameless plug for that, um, we updated that book. And as part of the update, um, we do have some really, really specific breeding protocols and recipes more for the rescue side of it or for the really, really small populations. And so that that discover piece is actually fleshed out a little, and discovering and rescue, those are fleshed out a little bit better in this is, edition than in the previous editions. And that, that was the reason for doing it as we had a call, mm -hmm. what do I do now? And we figured out if we just wrote it down, we could say, well, read the book. Yeah, I'm holding a copy of the second edition and Phil's referring to the third edition. And we do have the third edition, I believe, in stock in our online store. Me too. And then Phil also co-authored our Introduction to Heritage Breeds, which many of you probably already own. That is also available in our online store. And then most recently, Phil's solo book, and I don't think I can get the title to pick up on camera, but Practical Collar Genetics for Livestock Breeders. Phil, do you want to talk about this one since it's so new? Well, uh, that one's fairly new, and it, it actually goes into goats, sheep, cattle, and llamas and alpacas and pigs. And we um, goats actually turn out to be the most interesting. So um, the, the, the first chapters are in goats, and what, what I did was organize it, you know, basically in the science, and then so there's a chapter on the science, and then there's a chapter on the agonizing science. And then there's a chapter in, you know, basically, so what, you know, putting it, putting it to work, you know, some little projects that people have done where you could actually use this to get to the goals that you might have. So it, it, was, fun, it was fun to put together and hopefully it's useful to people. Oh, I'm sure it will be. Yep. Awesome. Do we have more shameless plugs, Brittany? Always. So <laughs> you can find all of, oh my goodness. My hands are off. <laughs> Apparently my computer is like, you must get this book now. <laughs> you can find all of those books on our website. That's livestockconservancy.org and our online store. Big thank you to Sandra and Phil today for joining us and sharing your time and knowledge. We appreciate you. Uh, thank you to Mana Pro for sponsoring Goat Chats today. We appreciate you. Uh, big thank you to all of our members and supporters uh, for making uh educational programming possible and supporting small farmers. Thank you to all of our goat breeders who are raising uh, heritage goats right now. We appreciate you. You're very important to the success of these breeds. Um, if you're not a member and you'd like to become a member, uh, you can do that on our website as well. Uh, and you can do that for as little as $4 a month. So I know I drink a lot more coffee than that every day. <laughs>
<laughs> awesome. Well, thanks again, everyone. We appreciate you. We'll be back in a couple of weeks to talk about myotonic goats with Renard Turner. Mm -hmm. And I think we have a Wooly Wednesday coming up as well. Mm -hmm. With Josephine Walton. Yeah. That's all right. All right. Well, everyone have a great afternoon. We hope to see you soon. Bye. Thanks for joining us, everybody. Phil, thank you so much. Sure.